Welcome to the Interestus Podcast, episode 46. Thank you to everybody tuning in, whether it's on the YouTube channel or Spotify or iTunes, wherever it is that you might be listening from. And I'll also be doing a bonus podcast after this, the They're Not There podcast on the Patreon. So thanks so much to all the patrons over there as well. Don't have a guest yet, but I do have guests scheduled. I'm going to have Tyler on again, who is a great creative from Tokyo, doing all sorts of cool directing, and it's just going to be cool to catch up with him. Uh, We have another guest. This is a good friend of mine who recently, like his accolades include, he was working on Invincible, that awesome animated series, more finally like the West doing an adult animated series over there on Amazon Prime, which was killer. And his team, his story is amazing, really. He's going to come on. I met him in university uh, and he works as a Foley artist. So it's one of these guys that when you watch a movie and you see subtle things happening within a scene, like say somebody, for example, picks up a coffee cup, that action will be accompanied by a sound. Never believe your ears watching a a obviously anything animated, but like, especially when you're watching things that are live action, all of the layered texturing sounds is called Foley. And that's what he works with. And he worked on Invincible. So when, and he didn't know when it became the number one streamed show in North America or whatever it was. And I was the one who told him, I was like, Dev, do you realize that Invincible is like number one now across like a whole bunch of platforms? And he was shocked and happy, obviously, that that happened. He's had such a fascinating career. And it's just been like to get the job in the first place years ago that he became the Foley artist, that the studio was a miracle. Uh, Then it was a miracle that things just kept evolving. And now he's doing like big Amazon Prime shows, Netflix and he pointed out that it's particularly interesting to work on these animated shows because we're in the realm of live action. A lot of the times it's really, really practical. And so much as you are still quite creative because you're coming up with all these different ways to create these sounds that you, you're seeing on the screen when it is in animated In the case of an animated feature, there's so many crazier things that will happen. And so it really pushes him in terms of what he's doing creatively there. So we've got Tyler coming on. We've got Dev coming on. uh, I've got Lisa in Japan. She's scheduled for near the end of the month. But until then, you just got to contend with me. So, you know, let's let's get through this the best we can. I'm coming fresh off of having gone to Kobe recently. And so I thought I would talk about that project. When I say recently, that would in fact be, uh, I got back today. And today is the 13th of November. So what was the reason? It's this kind of long tail. And that's why we're here on a podcast so that I can share and elaborate on this kind of thing specifically. So Working for wow to you, uh, commissioned as I am to create a couple projects for them a month, there was this cool three degrees of separation way that I sourced one of my videos. And that was that when I first arrived, I've spoken about Yi before. Yi is this awesome gem of a woman, a uh, model here, Chinese. And she and I worked together. And then afterwards, she said, it was cool hanging out. Why don't you come? to this party that I'm going to have on the weekend. There's this really cool guy. Uh, He's always organizing parties around Kobe, great person to be connected to. I said, sure, this sounds awesome. My God, a social life, such a thing exists. (laughs) So I I went out to this event and there at that event, uh, that party, I guess you would say, I met a lot of really wonderful people. And so uh, one of which was this woman, uh, she was Italian, I believe, and she said, oh, you you do the YouTube thing. That's really cool. Um, I happen to have some friends out in Kobe who work on this like, organic farm. And they're not so certain as to how, how to leverage social media uh, to increase the reach of their message. And their message is very much focused around uh, sustainable development goals, um, specifically the idea of 
doing things in a way that ends up being more significant than a weekend project. Like they want to do things that like totally upend, turn over the state of organic farming in Japan, which I learned from them is really still in its infancy. And so there's so much work there to be done, so much potential to evolve in Japan because they're just not doing it yet. And that was really, really cool. I was immediately intrigued by that. And so I needed to make a video. And I thought, hey, yeah, I'll go down and they've got some sort of like uh, rice, traditional rice planting event that goes on over the course of the weekend. And they're clearing away bamboo, which we'll relate to later in this story. And I made a video for Wilder U and it was a lot of fun making the video. And Yi, again, lovely woman that she is, came down and supported me to make that video. So I was very, very grateful to her. But then in meeting uh, Shinobu and Bahram, uh, he's Iranian, I believe. Shinobu is obviously Japanese. Uh, once they met me and we forged that first bridge together, they became increasingly interested in what I might be able to help them with beyond just this YouTube video that I was going to do for Wow to You Only in Japan. And they said what they have for me would be directly with Studio Garden Lab. This wouldn't be a Wow to You project. This would be with the studio I work with now where here's the story. So they're reclaiming this these bamboo forests and these bamboo forests have grown over uh, where farmers would use those fields for rice land and they need to figure out they wanted to figure out something that they could do that was more than simply burning all of this bamboo which you kind of necessarily have have to do something with it afterwards but what could they do that would be better and they looked into the sort of properties that bamboo has. And actually, they're really, really amazing. So I'm sure many people are aware of bamboo being used uh, as a wood alternative, although it is a grass. Did you know that? How crazy is that? Um, as a wood alternative. And but it also has antibacterial elements to it, as well as it has the potential to become fertilizer if you grind it up. So they they learned this from a farmer who said, I got to do something with this bamboo as well. Uh, if only I had this bamboo ground into a powder, I'd be able to do something with that. I'd be able to make a whole ecosystem cycle here of what it is that I've done. And they then got in contact with this machinist, I guess you would say, or I suppose he's in the business of machining significant mechanical parts for all kinds of machinery around Japan. Uh, his name's Hozumi-san. Ho, it's got that oh, long sound there, Hozumi-san. And so this guy, as he explained it to us, we went to his factory, they knew like a lot of what they do is a, a lot of it is like grinding things like that happens a lot in manufacturing, it turns out. So they already had a sense of what they would need to do to create a machine that would grind up this bamboo. And so this commercial capitalist interest dude by answering a practical problem of the farmer, which was, what do I do with all of this bamboo, was able to create a machine that would grind up the bamboo, turn it into a powder that could then be uh, converted into a compost agent. And also, if you sprinkle it, it's also it has I'm not sure what it is that's in it that has this effect, but it also is a natural, all natural repellent for pests as well. So kind of a miracle powder in terms of the applications that farmers could use it for. And Peace in Nature, which is the name of the original organic farm that I went and did the Wow Do You video with, they wanted our studio to tell the story of the I, I'm thinking like a three minute. That's where we're kind of at in the sort of brainstorming the length of it. A video that promotes the collaboration between Peace and Nature, a nonprofit organization, Organic Farm, this other farmer who had a practical need that he needed filled uh, and then wanted to do so in an environmental way. And then this company that has now pioneered this totally new machine that can break down bamboo and convert it into this very useful material. And so we went down the other day. And we did a whole bunch of filming. And it was really cool because as I progress in the studio, most of my experience, as I said before, I believe, I think even on the last podcast, I was talking about how 
no man is an island, although that is what I have had to be for the last eight years working on YouTube by myself. I would occasionally get a friend who would come out, maybe co-host, maybe have a guest on, but you're doing everything top to bottom. And in this case, it was a chance to collaborate and produce with a team, which was really, really amazing. So we got a bunch of whiteboards over at the lab now, and we sat down, three of us, and we brainstormed the the shooting schedule, the shot list, the whole story. We had a couple meetings. Um, oh, I didn't even mention the Kobe University is involved because the Peace and in Nature Initiative, they want to get, they want the powder to be used and they want students to become aware of sustainable development goals in such a way that it goes beyond lip service and weekend warrior kind of activities. They want to create uh, jobs that could be tenable positions for students to go into. But of course, getting students aware of these jobs and these new industries and trying to create products and systems of creating these sustainable uh, industries needs student involvement. So we had the university involved as well, where they're going to work with the bamboo in another way. The students are going to study the the machinery and the bamboo powder that is produced from it. They're involved. And so we created a schedule to go and see the university, to speak with the professor there, uh, to go and take a tour of the factory with Hozumi-san, who is just a great guy. The more and more we got to know him, super chill. And then as well, we went to see the farmer and we had him discuss on his farmland how he practically used this. Tons and tons of prep, which is not something I'm usually going into a video doing or had in the past. It was more like I got an idea roughly. I'm getting better. But uh, I mean, at most, some, I would. It's funny. I say I didn't do too much in some cases. Like if you do see my Kichi Joji video, uh, my Shimo Kitazawa video, I would do pre-work. I'd like research a neighborhood, select places to go and even make a shot list. So to be fair, I actually did do this, but by myself, that stuff was all done by myself. And so there's no out. There's no input that comes from outside. It's all from within myself. And. I am hopelessly locked to my own perspective. I, I can't get out of my perspective. That's the curse of the human condition. So that new set of eyes, those new opinions entering into the brainstorming session did so much. And of course, we all have different skills. And that's something I would touch on as I, I continue, as we discuss this uh, project that, uh, that we worked through that was really, really cool for me. Like now, finally, I would appreciate before working on a team. But the truth of it is, is that while I was doing something like teaching, which I respected, respect the hell out of teaching, uh, I think it's sad when people grow embittered and cynical about it in Japan, uh, because it really is something very, very special. But was my heart absolutely in that as something I wanted to do forever? No, it wasn't. And I own that too. And so when I would work in teams in that context, yeah... I kind of appreciate when I really appreciate, but it doesn't excite me when I see a, a cohesive team working together in that way, because my heart's not quite in it. So even while I acknowledge the skills and strengths that team members will bring, I don't get as, get as excited about it. Whereas here with this, I am all in. I am going all the way. I, I love video production so much that when I see the people who were with me, we had Joe, director of photography. Uh, we had Drew, basically producer on the show uh, or for the day. And then me more in a cinematographer kind of role. I could really see how we were doing very well. And it was useful for me to reflect on that during the course of and afterwards, each person filling in their skill set and strengths. Oh, and may it never be not mentioned, our drone pilot, uh, Michal who is one hell of a pilot, got us some incredible footage, great stuff, five stars, wonderful. So we had a team of four, in fact. So we got down there, we got to the university and the Kobe University, this one, because obviously I'm certain that Kobe has a number of universities, but this one, this one was on the ocean. And that's so beautiful. Now, there was a real nostalgic element for me there because... I come from an island. <laughs> and so for my whole life growing up, I'm used to 
being next to the water. And when I went to university, when I went to uh, I went to University of British Columbia, it's on the water as well. But where you would walk down to the water, I was probably like a five minute walk from my residence uh, right next to Rec Beach. If you want to look that up, nude beach <laughs> right beside the university. And but it was still, you know, it's a five minute walk. Loved it. Beautiful. Different than what I'm describing now. But Kobe University is literally right there. Like the building, the cafeteria looks out onto the ocean. It's gorgeous. We get, And we got fantastic weather and very, very welcoming staff. Uh, Eda Sensei was the woman responsible for this particular uh, educational, this class. Let's call it that. This class that she was responsible for. And... Went there, filmed all around the university, getting really good coverage at the start of it. And I could see right away. So I have to start filming as soon as I'm there. And that means that my time for chit chat is not it's 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 gone. It's absent because I need to be thinking about shots. I need to be moving. I need to make as efficient use of my time as I possibly can. And that means getting your head down and getting all the shots that you need. But then that means where we met Bahram and Shinobu and Eda Sensei there that, well, they're going to be there because they're my host for me to come to the university. But if I don't speak to them, then what will become of them? And I don't want to be rude, but I'm, it's a rock and a hard place. With Drew there, and we'd scheduled everything as well, Drew is totally aware of the schedule. Drew is perfectly bilingual, so he's he's essentially a translator. In fact, he's done that a great deal. Um, action, like live action translating, like on the spot, he can translate. And so he's making them feel uh, welcomed and also looked after. So he's speaking to the university professor the whole time about the the plan that she has, the curriculum for this course, uh, making Bahram and Shinobu feel like their investment in us is paying off because we, he knows the schedule. He's, he's making them feel like they're a part of the whole thing, and that's totally invaluable. And then we have our, I guess you would call him, he's, he's like I said, director of photography, uh, our lounge manager, Joe, who's come out and shown like an intense interest in learning all this stuff. And I would love to teach him. I've always wanted to teach somebody everything I know about this. And whereas we don't have so much gear yet, that'll change come the new year. But where I'm the guy with the camera right now, but we're going to grab a few more bodies in the new years. He felt like, oh, I don't know if I did that much, but he was basically like the grip. Uh, I think you would call him like a studio set. So the guy was like setting everything up that I became so much more efficient because he'd be like, what do you need? He'd be like, swap my lenses for me. He'd basically prep all the gear that we could just flow. Whereas usually I had to mess around in my bags and do all of this stuff again by myself, him taking care of that. It could not be overstated that the, the massive help that that was for me to get the filming done. So it was smooth as silk. We had our, we had our shot list, uh, we had our schedule. Everything went according to plan. We had a beautiful lunch right next to the water. As I said, that's where the cafeteria was. So we ate at the university. Really good food. Finished up there. And then we went to the factory and met Hozumi-san. And it's so cool, like, meeting these great people. Here's a guy who is very much your standard issue capitalist. This is a guy who is he started his business He's grown it slowly. He's now doing well. And but it's not as though he is just that one guy is not just he's not profit driven. He's interest driven. This was a passion that he has. He loves creating uh, fabricated metal objects for different things like Shinkansen and escalators. It's his passion. And it's cool to see the more human side of an entrepreneur like that, because when we were getting into the discussion of why did you make the machine to do this? It was so clear that it would be, it was, yes, it's sustainable, but it was just fun. This guy loves what he does and it was so accommodating 
of the the filming that we did there so we got all these cool options he gave us a tour of the factory you're going around to all these huge metal fabrication machines that are like just intense like seeing them work like the 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 industrial level at which they're forming these like often very massive components that would make up like the underside of a shinkansen as i say something like that really really intense items coming out of this place and then when our drone pilot arrived, when Michal arrived, he, again, super accommodating, not stuffy at all, uh, wanted us to get as many cool shots as we possibly could, uh, encouraged us. We were like, is it cool if we fly inside the factory? It was like, yeah, absolutely no problem. Now, if you were a shitty drone pilot, I would not recommend this. If you were just learning, I would not recommend it, but thank uh baby jesus and his golden fleecy diapers that we have mihao and his his flying is top notch and so there we we had no concern he was definitely like talking about how challenging it was because there was like a lot of weird wind tunnels inside the factory that could push the drone but he, he navigated that well and we got these cool shots of like flying over all the machines pointing the camera down looking at all the people as they're like working uh, to fabricate the different products that are coming out of there and basically just the coolest shots that you could possibly imagine so that's sweet and then we had an interview. So, of course, we were going to go there. We were going to see the machine. Uh, we were going to get great shots of the factory as we did with the drone and me walking around. But we were going to have an interview. And then again, where we pre-planned all this, we had all of our questions that we were going to ask him. But this needs to be done in Japanese. And so, bam, there you go. Mihao and Drew are both perfectly fluent, perfectly bilingual, like N1 level Japanese and beyond. It's it's just it's it's in them completely. Um I feel that they speak more eloquently than some Japanese people. <laughs> I've said to to be fair, I've said that of Mihao because Mihao is actually from Poland and his English, I've said it to him before. I was like, Mihao, you speak better English than native speakers. He really does. It is not his first language. It was not taught to him in school. He taught it to himself and speaks beautifully, incredibly eloquent, incredibly articulate, a level of vocab that blows my mind. And these guys are pulling that off in Japanese as well. But his his English like affirms that to me where I know that his Japanese very likely the same as is impressive or more eloquent than some native speakers in the language. So good to have on your team when you're needing to interview Japanese people. And so Drew uh, conducted the interview with uh, Hozumi-san and I got the sense that he was totally at ease. He was like smiling the whole time. Drew was a great interviewer. So talking about skill sets, that's just something I couldn't have in my videos before. I, I, can, I can absolutely now, I'm confident, I can say that I am conversational, but interviews, interviewing somebody would be far, it's just too in-depth too in-depth. Uh, my level of conversational Japanese would not match the requirements to do that in a really, really effective way. So we got a great interview out of Hozumi-san. He took us by Kobe Joel, which I believe, I think Joel is castle because it better be because that's what we went by. I was stunned. It is a gorgeous castle. It's interesting the whole, the amount of art that goes into Japanese castles where I, I like medieval European castles and their sort of brutalism. Some may be beautiful. In fact, my buddy's getting married in Scotland next April and I'll be going there uh, to celebrate with him. He's been putting that off for a little while <laughs> with the Rona. And now we're going to go over there. And so not saying that you don't have beautiful castles in Europe, but the swooping roofs and architectural style of Japanese castles really makes them look more artistic than they seem threatening or intimidating, although they very specifically are. This particular castle in Kobe is up like so elevated, basically that wherever you stood in the surrounding countryside, this thing looms above you, you know the hierarchy is very, very clear. And these guys up here are the upper crust and you down below are the peasants. You can totally feel it. But I didn't appreciate the scale 
that this castle was built to because when you see it you see the main if you can imagine it's basically like the main castle structure but what you don't realize is that when you get a little closer and you can see how the castle looks in greater detail that actually that's just the center of it it actually broadens from there and there's a whole nother terrace of secondary and tertiary buildings that surround that main central structure it's big it's a really big castle yard and additional buildings and all of them are immaculately maintained and really 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 nice so we got to see that that was really cool never seen that before never haven't explored kobe that much so that was another great reason to get out there so now we went and finished off finally after we went factory university and then we went and visited the farmer and we had an interview with him out in his farmer fields in his uh, greenhouses. We got him doing a little bit of spreading of the uh, the powdered bamboo fertilizer and this great shot. I'm a I'm a man who enjoys some diffuse light because soft light looks really good. That's actually uh, for anybody listening, this won't make as much sense. But behind me here, these, um, I believe it's shoji, these are called, or fusumi, I can't remember. But basically, I have these soft paper windows that are behind me here, and they're great because they diffuse the light coming through. Well, when he's in the greenhouse, the uh, laminate sheet was having the same effect. So we got some gorgeous, gorgeous shots um, of actually conducting the interview. And since he's standing in the middle of the greenhouse, the way that it extends behind him with all these like following lines, leading lines, it's really symmetrically satisfying. You'll, you'll have an eye for it. If you end up do seeing this, because I'll link you guys where you could go to watch this once we have produced the video. There's some really beautiful shots in there that I'm, I'm quite proud of. So we had the greatest day went off super smooth without a hitch got all the shots that we needed everyone felt attended to appreciated everyone filled in a very specific role where their strength got a shine on the project which was incredible it made me really really happy to to be a part of that and then afterwards we we went back to not kobe station but one nearby we'd uh, booked a hotel for the evening we went to this cool again Mihao, our pilot he is familiar with the area because he's done a lot of work there he knew the hotel that we should book which was awesome and near the hotel it was called like kenny's it was this cool upbeat soul british pub vibe Japanese guy who runs a little hole in the wall place, went up there for a couple of whiskeys, grabbed myself a wild turkey eight year. It was great. Uh, then we went back, dropped our stuff off at the hotel, and then we went out for dinner. And I haven't done this in a while. And it was it was just right to uh, keep fighting those cows. I'm down to 87 kilograms now. I'm fighting all the way down. I thought 86 would be my goal. But now I'm like, holy shit, I'm basically 86. And so now we just got to keep going. I think... 82 is going to be my absolute leanest. Like I'm six, one and a half, 186 centimeters, big legs, big dude. I, I don't think it would actually be healthy if I were to drop down. <laughs> I should not be lower than 80 kilograms. I'll say that. And I've also, I've been going to the gym. We'll talk about that as well as we enter into the second half of the podcast here. So don't go away. And with the magic of editing, as they say, we will continue along. Welcome back. We were never really gone. Part two. We went out for this awesome seafood dinner following getting checked into the hotel. And it was so good. We got these we got these prawns. We got hodate, which I think is scallops or it's, it's a type of shellfish, which is amazing. And you, you basically it's like yakiniku where you would barbecue it, but you barbecue your seafood there. We got amazing sashimi. Uh, we got... There was this, it's called like forest potato. And then the, basically neba neba is like, it, it refers to the, um, the slimy gooey texture. And I usually hate this kind of stuff aside from natto. But the guy said that this little amuse bouche, this appetizer that came out, they insisted that it had wonderful play, flavors. So I overcame my disgust for all things slimy. And I uh, I tried it out and it was actually very, very good. It was kind of like a vinegary, um, but savory flavored kind of thing. But so many good items there. What else did we have? Um, so we had the prawns. We had the scallops. We had the sashimi. Oh, we got something. It's a type of white fish called hoke. 
And apparently in Hokkaido, they have like incredible, beautiful, delicious, buttery white fish like this. But this one was very good anyways. We got a big salmon filet. Mwah, chef's kiss. We're talking about absolutely delicious stuff that we were having. It was it was so good. Um, no complaints. And so we just ate ourselves silly there, filling up with, oh, and sea grapes. I've never had that before either, but it was very good. I'm still trying new things in Japan. Who would have thought after eight years, there's still tons of new food to try. And sea grapes are, it's just how you might imagine. It's a type of seaweed, I suppose. And they have these little tiny bulbs that look like grapes. And you have that one with, again, a sort of like savory, vinegary uh, kind of um, sauce. And that was really, really good. What else did we have? My podcast has devolved into me just talking about a delicious dinner, but it was so good. And I haven't done it in a while. This like seafood bonanza. Um, anyways, amazing stuff. I've got the whole okay, I got the salmon mentioned there, the sea grapes, the sashimi, such great sashimi, the um, all of the wonderful stuff. So we go in there. We're having nama beer. We're drinking lots of beers, lots of water, too. We were conscientious of that. And then we wrapped up dinner and we're like, well, you know, is it is it really that we should we should have to go home now? <laughs> and there's still something very awesome to enjoy at the uh, hotel when we return. We thought, OK, well, let's go. Let's go out for a little bit more. And let's go to a bar. And again, Mihao knows the area. So he takes us to this place. He says, it's awesome. It looks awesome. Everybody in there knows him. Uh, very, very welcoming to us. But downstairs was totally full. So they said, you guys want to go up to the rooftop? Of course. Of course, I want to go to the rooftop. So we go up there. Such cool views of like the surrounding city in Kobe. I, I love living in Japan so much, so, so much. And moving and living, living in Kyoto to have the proximity of Osaka and Kobe right there is just so cool. Like these iconic cities. And so we went there. We were careful not to drink too much there. We basically, we grabbed one drink. I think I grabbed myself another it was like a Maker's Mark whiskey, something like that. Just had a bunch of wonderful conversation. We got some great stories out of Michal from back in the old country from Poland. And then to cap off this whole amazing evening back at the hotel that we were staying at, they actually have an onsen there. And it's really high quality. The actual hot sauna, really nice, cool, like warm candle lighting in it. Really, really high quality. Uh, very spacious. Not many people were in there at that time. Uh, hot sauna was amazing. Showers were great. And then the actual outside baths the, and outside too. They had some inside, but they had some outside. And the outside's great because then you get that... Um, what, what would you call it? Like kukio furo, like just air bath. You know, when you're not inside, you sit out in the air. And that's one of the best things you can do if you haven't. I'm telling you, uh, onsen culture, you want to, you also want to lean up now that I've discovered the secret of the hot baths. It's incredible the weight that you lose and lean out from all of that sweating. Even if it's water weight, it's good to give you a sense of just how much water weight you're carrying around with you. Like I have been losing. Now at a low end, I lose a kilogram when I go in. So that's about 2.2 pounds. At the high end the other day, I lost 1.7 kilograms of water, <laughs> which is just nuts. And you feel fantastic afterwards, look fantastic. Anywho, so the baths outside, usually when you go into an onsen, there's, of course, a variation in terms of how cold is the cold bath, how hot is the hot bath. This hot bath... I would, I would go for hotter if I was going for a mean sweat, but I wanted to be comfortable. It's been a long day. The temperature of the hot bath there was divine. It was perfect. We were all talking about it too, how specifically good the... Um, the, the temperature was in the baths that they had there. It was open till one o'clock and then we we crashed and had a great sleep, got up in the morning Drew came back to Kyoto quite early. Uh, Mihao and I went out for uh, coffee, grabbed a coffee from Starbucks, and I return now here. I sit before you making this podcast. And so it was awesome. Absolutely awesome. I've now, we've done teamwork when it's come to creating Wow to You productions, but this was the first teamwork that we've done for 
Studio Garden Lab. It was incredible. I cannot wait to do more of it. And uh, a total journey and great reason to see more of Kobe. Kobe, I'm discovering, is this awesome city. Osaka is this awesome city. Everywhere that you go in Kansai seems to be wonderful. And I can't wait, actually, where by extension of this exploration, I've gone up to Obama. That's on the Japan, uh, Japan Sea. Uh, I've gone down now to Wakayama, which is south. I've been doing these tourist promotional. I'm ridiculously good looking model guy for these things, which I could actually I could speak a little bit about that. That was among one of the coolest things I've again now done recently where I've met Kaysan and we're hoping to do more studio work with Kaysan, but Kaysan is in the process of creating, releasing, promoting, constructing, ever, ever forming all the pieces on the board that are required to make a premium, high-end tourist experience of Wakayama. And what he needed for that is because it's being specifically marketed to Western or European audiences, although, of course, Japanese people would still come and do this, but they really want to target heavily abroad. Um, or And for that sake, I'm sure to Chinese and Southeast Asia, but foreign uh, in investment, foreign participants in these in these tours. And so he needed some not Japanese people to be the people who show up in the promotional videos that are being made. And so I've been hired out from Garden Lab to go be that guy. And I think aside from the job that I do now is the digital guy, digital media director at Garden Lab. It is the best job I've ever had in my entire life. You go and experience this high-end tour and you're being paid to do it while being filmed while you're doing it. What this is amazing. And the last thing that we went and did was that we'd gone to Wakayama before. And now we needed to return because we had one more day of it was like glamping that they wanted to show off this like glamour camping. Right. And one of the things, one of the pieces of the experience is that you would go to this campsite. That's where we went to film. And then a table is set up for you down on the beach and then a private chef will create your dinner for you and you have dinner on the beach and it's just the coolest thing ever. Now, it's funny because this is supposed to be a summer, kind of like maybe a spring summer kind of uh, tourism tourist experience that you would have, but it's like. November. <laughs> and so we're supposed to be dressed in these light summery clothes. But when the winds was sorry, when the sun's going down, it's getting pretty chilly. Although it was one of the first times where I was like, I feel totally spoiled where whenever it was like between shots where they're like pouring wine and they need a drone to fly over while I'm drinking champagne. And they're like, again, I'm like, oh, if I have to, God. <laughs> but between shots where they're setting up to do things again, they kept being like, get them, you know, you know, like get them, get them warm things. And they like bring over like hot coffee or like a jacket for me or something. I was like, yeah, I totally deserve this. Hmm. <laughs> not, not even slightly. Uh, but to be so looked after in that way, it was cool. Who doesn't like being pampered in some amount? So that was a lot of fun. I'm doing that with Sophie. I, I may have talked about her in the last podcast. It's really cool. She's like one of my new friend who is a girl. And I like these kind of people. I never had a sister. I always thought it'd be cool to have a sister if you had a good relationship with her. And I feel like a very sisterly connection to her. I think I may have said that in the last podcast, but I really do mean it. It's a great relationship that we have. And I'm always saying I'm trying to like joke on Instagram that this is my wife, seeing if I can fool a few people like 10 more years to our marriage and stuff like that. I'll put it in the stories. I don't think anybody's fallen for it. Not a single soul, but that's OK. I think I said this last podcast. That's OK. So now where are we in terms of progress for that piece in nature video? I've now told you about this, this other thing that I've done here with um, the other job with k which hopefully I should. That's how I should cap that off. Well, we're working with k right now like that, uh, where I just go out and uh, I'm hanging out on the tour. 
because of our background in videography or studio, there is potential in the future that we're looking at to work in that way with Kason, where as opposed to being in front of the camera, we're going to get behind the camera and produce some stuff with him, which would be amazing because this guy, I, I'm not going to go into detail because now I'm remembering like, yes, I absolutely must have talked about him in the last one. One of the most fascinating Japanese people I've ever met, uh, speak Spanish, lived in Colombia, lived in Mexico, very well traveled in Japan, appreciates parts of Japan. And I think a way that a lot of people who have lived there, lived here their whole lives do not appreciate Japan. He's a really great to, to use that kind of tired phrase, he's a great ambassador for the country. And I would love for our business relationship to strengthen and for us to go on and do some really, really, really cool stuff together. And I'm certain we will. We're, we're like minded creatives. And I think we're going to we're going to come up with some really, really wonderful things in the not too distant future. So aside from that, what else is happening around here? Well, it's gotten quite cold. That's one thing. But that gives me good reason to be inside and to be editing. And we have gotten just some incredible footage. So something I want to report on, talk about a little bit more now is our buddy Sandro, who is not directly employed by Garden Lab, but works with us a lot. He's another videographer here. He started to come out. He started to show up way more consistently to um to the projects that we're working on and because he does this professionally it's his job he as well has some gear and maybe this will be a little bit like just sounds coming out of my mouth now for people who really aren't that into um videography and cameras and stuff but it blows me away and that's why i'm going to talk about it he has the canon r5 and if you know anything about camera bodies this one is serious so it's a full frame camera, which means it has the largest sensor that you can get. It can record 120 frames per second 4K. It can record in 8K. And its low light performance is one of the most incredible things to behold. Like you can barely have a candle flame in the room and it, it will be enough light for this camera to capture like an exquisite shot. He's been coming out more. And we have footage from him for a couple of different projects that is now going to start to show up in the stuff that I create on my channel. And I, I think you'll, you'll know, you'll know when you see the shots, like that doesn't look like Dave's Sony, like low, I'm, I'm basically, entry, I'm below entry level with the A6500 that I have as it's a crop sensor, it's not a full sensor. Uh, so the addition of his footage is a great strengthening for the kind of things that we can uh, create on Dave Trippin, but then as well for Studio Garden Lab. So it's it's been awesome working with him. He is he is a director. He has a fantastic eye for composition. The man would rather not be caught dead. And in <laughs> sorry, he would rather not be caught dead editing, but that's why I'm here. If he can capture amazing shots, it's all I ask and he's doing that a lot more. So I actually have to run. I have an appointment now, but thank you for tuning in to this, the 46th episode of the Interstice podcast. Perhaps the next will be the one where we have our first guest. Can't guarantee, but there'll be many more fascinating things to discuss. Um, please do consider supporting me on Patreon. If you don't, that's cool. I just appreciate you showing up here. Thank you so much for that. Take care. Hug the ones you love. Tell them that you love them. And until we meet next time, peace.